Hi, everyone. I'm Marty Resch. I took uh, Snort from being a 1,200 line piece of code that I wrote in a weekend, and I turned it into a billion dollar company that I then sold to Cisco for $2.7 billion. This is what I would say if I was Marty Resch, but I'm actually Patrick Mullen. I am the uh, manager of the uh, response research team inside of Talos Security Group, inside of secure, uh, Cisco. This is me touring around before I got here, so had a lot of fun. Uh, but anyway, so I've actually spent a lot of time in Snort. I uh, was one of the early developers, a major contributor. I wrote the first preprocessor for Snort uh, way back in the day. And I'm here to talk about some of the things that uh, we learned from Snort being a, uh, a successful open source project and how we turned it into a company that, you know, seems to, seems to be doing pretty well. <laughs> this here is actually Marty as I know him as opposed to the first slide, which is the, uh, the formal one that they always show everywhere. Marty actually sits down the, down the hall from me. Um, I've worked with him for quite a number of years, actually at two different companies. Um, and since we do talk all the time, I get to have some of his insights into what works, what doesn't work, some of the visions and stuff like that. So while unfortunately he cannot be here today, he's actually flying over to uh, San Jose. Um, I, I hope I can be a good substitute. So let's talk a bit about uh, open source and what is good about it. Open software should be free. Free as in beer. Fr uh, software is the culmination of knowledge that uh, is embodied by what comes out of the fingers of the programmer. Knowledge is power, power belongs to the people, software belongs to the people. You should not be able to sell it, you should be able to just give it to free, and people should be able to take pieces of it to reuse at will. That is what uh, Richard Solomon would like you to know. He can be a little controversial, so let's go with somebody that's a little less controversial by Eric Raymond. In 1997, Eric Raymond put together a, uh, an essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Uh, it's it's actually a fantastic piece. It's not too long. I recommend reading it sometime. Uh, but what he did is he learned, he took his observations that he made from looking at the traditional software model, software development model, where you take and you do development uh, in pieces, and you have just a small number of people that put together the requirements, do the design, do the coding, do the testing, and do the release. And then these releases end up being six months, a year, or more apart. What, and this has worked. I mean, this works for both open source and for, um, and for closed source. And we're here to talk about open, so open source, but it really works in both. There's a lot of projects to do this. It works pretty well, but there are limitations. And what I'm here to talk about is more the bazaar, which is what he calls the model that was employed by Linux back in the day, or still to this day. The bazaar is more of a, more chaos driven. Uh, people are, you know, you have a number of people are doing the development. You release early, you release often. Uh, you really have the community work hard to put out the software. Some of the benefits of this is that you find features that are not useful and they kind of go, go away. Features that are useful, features that you didn't even know were something that you should have. Uh, when you have a number of people and they all have their own idea of how the software should go and you give them the ability to make an impact, people become really excited. Not only are you, is your user base somebody that's using the software and telling you what, what is good and what is not good, they actually have the ability to create new content and new features and then give that back to you so that you can distribute it to your other users and feed the system. The other benefit is that with, a num with, with enough eyes, all bugs become shallow. And what that means is that if you have say a, a dedicated team of QA engineers, test engineers that are looking at the software, say 10 people or whatever, they have to go through all the software to find all the bugs. You know, that's just the way it is. But if say you have hundreds or hopefully thousands if, you're, uh, if you get that far along, people looking at the software, they're gonna use software in ways that you never dreamed of. And with open source, they're probably running on a hardware you didn't even dream of. This really roots out a lot of, a lot of problems. And on top of that, they tend to be more technically savvy. Um, you get, a lot of times with these kinds of projects, you can really get bug reports that say, hey, I found this problem. It's on this, this is how to trigger it. This is where the actual problem manifests itself, and here's a fix. I mean, that's the ideal, of course, but there's also even, you know, just say, hey, this is what I was doing. This is what's broken. It still tends to be a lot better than a lot of the, uh, the trouble tickets that you get in uh, commercial software where it's like, oh, this doesn't work. 
I'm paying you money, you figure it out. You know, go, go leave me alone, just come back when it's fixed. Um, also, when you have long release cycles, which is kind of the cathedral idea, whether it's an open source project or a commercial project, there's not a lot of visibility from the outside. So people kind of, I'll, I'll be frank, to be honest, they might lose interest, right? They put something out there, they, they want to fix, they're excited, they're like, hey, this is cool, but this is broken, can you fix it? If they have to wait a long time for it to, to come about being fixed, then they're probably going to wander away and try something else. Or what's worse is they have a feature that they think is going to be done, they wait six months to a year or more, and then that, that new version comes out and it's not even there at all, or it doesn't do what they thought it would do, and it just, you know, it really lets them down. If you have a, a short cycle, then that feedback loop happens a lot faster, and when they see momentum, people are a lot more willing to hang out and, and wait for things to, to happen. But it all comes down to community. Snort always had a great community. That's actually the community that got me started. So way back, 99-ish, uh, I, I saw an announcement for this new software product, Snort. Snort. And I don't know, maybe it was on Slashdot when people went to that, or Fresh Meat when that was even still around. But it sounded pretty cool. You know, I saw that it had a vibrant community, and I went there, and I, and I just, honestly, I did just a bunch of little things here and there. But one of the things that Marty had put in there that was really cool was a to-do list. Hey, these are things that we think would be cool to have in this software. Is anyone interested in writing it? So I looked through there. I found something on the list. Uh, it was a port scan detector, because back in the 90s, port scans were interesting. It's, they aren't as interesting now, but, <laughs> but uh, at the time, it was interesting. And that was my, one of my claims to fame, is that I wrote the, uh, the first, uh, first preprocessor for Snort. One of the things that Marty will be sure to let you know is that, and also from uh, Eric Raymond's talk, is that fostering that community is of key importance. Without it, with people just submitting patches and things disappearing and never being heard from again, people just wander away and the project's gonna die. So always make sure that you um, respond to all emails and bug requests, bug reports. In the first year of Snort's life, Marty wrote like 2,000 messages. I mean, he had other things going on too, which makes it even more, more crazy, but uh, he, he took great pride in responding to every email that he felt was, uh, required his attention. On top of that, he released a new, a new version every two weeks. Again, making sure that things always had things coming up, people were always engaged, oh, hey, look, oh, it's, it's, it's Wednesday, it's another day to get another version of Snort, let's check it out, let's see what's new, let's see what's changed, and let's see what's broken we need to fix. Uh, so anyway, so, so yeah, 26 releases in the first year of Snort's life. Pretty hectic, rapid, rapid pace. Clam AV is, uh, is another project that Sourcefire was doing before the acquisition. Honestly, I can't tell you too much about the history of Clam AV because it was um, not what I was working on, but what I do want to mention is that it has a fantastic uh, user community, and it had that great community before, before Sourcefire acquired it, and we kept it going. The Clam AV is embedded into a lot of different devices um, and a lot of different processes, not just within Sourcefire, but also external entities. And that is because it's open source. We were able to allow people to use this. And by having all these different products use Clam AV and getting this uh, user base going, we were able to get a lot of information ourselves in return. Clam AV results in hundreds of thousands of malware samples being sent to us every day. From that, we were able to do our analyses, run it through sandboxes, create detections, and feed that detection into, back into Clam AV, of course, uh, into Snort, into AMP, our advanced malware protection uh, suite of tools, um, different uh, reputation feeds, and a lot of other things. All this is, is possible because we allowed the community to keep going, keep running with it, and we'll often get, uh, if you look at malware analyses online, a lot of times they will have uh, Clam AV signature is made available for you right there that you can incorporate. 
And again, that's because the community is, is alive and thriving. So these were both uh, pieces of software that were open source before the acquisition, before Cisco bought Sourcefire. Uh, people were very nervous when we were bought because they were afraid that the open source model was going to die. All these utilities that people were using and liked were going to suddenly become closed source. I mean, Cisco does not exactly have the greatest reputation of giving away stuff for free. They started off as a hardware company, which is really hard to give away. And then they're, they're moving more and more to software. But this is something that we're giving away for free. Uh, we actually went through the exact same thing when Sourcefire was created, because open so uh, Snort was open source and had a lot of contributions from a lot of people who obviously weren't going to be getting jobs at Sourcefire. Uh, they were afraid that their work was going to be lost and that suddenly people were going to have to buy Snort and buy rules and everything else, but we made sure that we didn't. And one of the reasons why it worked in the Snort example is because we kept track of what it was that we were giving away for free, Snort, and what it was that we were selling. What we were selling was management, scalability, performance, um, so, as that support, and um, yeah, and scalability. So while we gave away the engine for free and still do to this day, what we did is we provided a lot of the support that's needed to make it that much better and that enterprise customers are looking for. So if you're looking for a way that your, that your company can use open source software to actually make money, that's what you do. It's kind of, you know, they didn't exist back then, but it's kind of like the freemium model that they have today. You know, freemium, it combines the word free, costing nothing, and the Latin meum, which means not really. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody watches South Park, but, but anyway, so there's definitely ways that you can add a lot of value and make money on it while still giving away the core, the core uh, technologies. And just like ClamAB, Snort also benefits from people writing Snort rules for us. Uh, we get submissions all the time. They you know, help us help other customers have detections, and we put that information into the uh, uh, author's file so that they get their name in lights, which is actually a powerful motivator. You don't even have to give people um, squishy pigs or, or money or anything. They just want to see their name in lights. I've also been there myself. That's why I started on Snort way back when. Um, but anyway, so we actually continue open source today. Uh, last year, we released, uh, we released the uh, Open App ID software. So this is a plugin for Snort. What it does is it is an open source next generation firewall. Uh, probably everyone knows, but if everyone doesn't, next generation firewalls, what it does is it allows you to give fine grained control over applications that you see on your network. So while you want to have people be able to access the web on their desktop, maybe you don't want them to access Fire Facebook, so you block that. Or you want them to access Facebook, but not chat. So you can do that. You can actually allow Facebook, but then say, oh, but chat, no, you can't do that. Or you want to allow both of those, but now you want to block Farmville and Candy Crush Saga and all that stuff. You want people to actually do work or something, you know, one of those crazy things. Um, anyway, that's all things that are available. Obviously, you can also do things other than just, uh, just web. It's just the web is ubiquitous and it's just easy to understand. Um, we released the software on open source for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's because uh, we want more people to use it. Uh, the, the NGFW market is, is really competitive. There's a lot of people. I mean, I'm sure if you walk down there, you'll see 20 different places that will say, hey, use our NGFW. Um, but what we want is to get great penetration. The best way to do that is by offering stuff for free. And by offering it for free, you get more people using it. You find more problems. You find uh, more fixes. And when it comes time to actually make a purchase, people remember, oh, hey, you know, we were using this anyway. Why don't, we go to, why don't we go to Cisco to actually buy all this extra stuff? The other benefit is that there's no way that we could possibly know every application that's out there, nor could we know which applications people want access to and which ones they don't. So by making it available to people, they can create rules for tailor fitting their network and their access control through this product. And then by supplying it back to us, we can then provide it to other people as well. So you actually get this great feedback loop of your customers help you help other customers. And these are all things that you can't do 
if you make even the rules language close, which going back to snort, since that's obviously what I'm, I'm most used to, uh, a lot, most other IDS and IPS systems, you can't even create new rules, or if you can, it's really hard. Where Snort allows it, to, makes it very easy so that they can submit it to us and write their own and all that other stuff. All right, so that's how we're using open source uh, going forward. But also, there's, I, I hesitate a little bit because this is actually kind of a loaded thing. Uh, in December, we finally released Snort 3.0 pre-pre-alpha, very, very early, but a great example of the open source model of release early, release often. The reason why I had a pause before going over Snort 3 is because it was first attempted, calling it Snort 3, it was first attempted seven or 10 years ago. It was quite a while ago, maybe seven years. Uh, it had a lot of lofty goals, you know, multi-threaded support, uh, improvements to the rule language, improvements to protocol support, and various other things, so lofty in fact that we ran into problems and realized that, uh, that Intel's uh, pipelining just wasn't working for us. <laughs> and it actually resulted in uh, performance degradation and it was scrapped. Uh, a lot of the features that were added to it, or I shouldn't say added to, that were intended for it, ended up being implemented uh, within the Snort regular code base. Uh, but what, what still ended up happening was whenever we went to a, a conference or trade show and mentioned Snort at all, we'd always get the question, hey man, when's Snort 3.0 coming out? It actually became kind of a joke and whenever somebody would ask, you kind of kind of giggle. Um, but it is here now. It is pre-pre-alpha, like I said. Um, and it's, we released it uh, right before Christmas, uh, so the middle of December. And there was a little, you know, between the holiday, New Year's, and a little glitch that we had, we're trying to maintain the model I was mentioning before. A release every two weeks, so that way people, you can see the things are going, uh, are, are happening and progressing. And then every month we're going to have a new tarball that you can just download if you want to take it, do the easy way and not go through GitHub. So you can actually look for this now. You can go on, I'm oh, sorry, this. Uh, you can go on GitHub, find Snort3, download it. Uh, tr give it a try. I, I highly recommend it. It's got a lot of great things. We fixed the rules language. Uh, Snort has the dubious uh, thing where it's been around for 15 years, and what's happened is we've learned a lot of stuff, which is great. But it means that the rules language has gotten kind of clunky over time, and it's gotten kind of ugly. So we fixed a lot of problems in that, um, which goes back to the Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is always plan on throwing away a version of your software. Not because it's bad, but because you never really understand the problem until you've already implemented the solution. When you start off, you're like, this is what I want to do. You put it all together, look at the final, final product, and yeah, it works. I mean, Snort 2.9 is, is fantastic. It does a lot of really good things. It does what we want. It's, uh, it's reliable, but like I said, we have 15 years of knowledge that's gone into this and things that have uh, kind of stayed there due to legacy reasons, we're now ready to move on and, and make you know, this, this great new thing. Like I said, it's definitely not dead. Uh, definitely stay around with uh, Snort 2.9. You know, 3.0 isn't gonna be general availability in, at least for a year, it's gonna be a while. But it's got a lot of cool things. Uh, I'll be covering some of the, actually, if you want to, if you're interested on, on the rules language, I have a talk tomorrow at 3.30, way in the back, uh, that will talk about uh, the different ways that we do the rules language now, and I will touch some on the, uh, the store three changes, if there's time. But a little quick, quick shameless plug. All right, so, if you think that you, ha if you have any, if you're thinking about doing some open source software, you know, whether for personal use or for company use. Uh, one thing I want to say, which is to do it now. It's, it is uh, very easy for someday to become never. Uh, one of the greatest problems that open source projects have, whether it's the first version or the 50th version, is that uh, developers like to wait till the last minute. It's really hard to, to take the baby and push it out into the world, just, 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 just put it out there. Because uh, the truth is, if you have a problem that you're trying to solve, the, pro the chances of you being the only one with that problem are slim. 
and somebody is probably looking for a solution just like what you have, or maybe even better, it's similar but uh, not exactly the same. They want to do something, take what you use as a base, expand upon it, and uh, make things that you didn't even realize were, were needed. Question? You know, for for a, a developer, what's a good way to get started with Snort? What are some tools you have? How can we come up to speed on it? All right, so for use, uh, so the question is how does a developer get up to speed on Snort? Now is that um, as a user or as a developer? I mean, are you looking to write Snort rules or are you looking to uh, add functionality to it? Add functionality to it? Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, since you are the first person to ask a question, I won't throw this at you, it's kind of heavy. <laughs> All right, so anyway, so the question is how do you start development on Snort? Uh, like I said, Snort's still open source, so uh, yeah, definitely uh, provide patches. <sighs> really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I mean, there is documentation out there. Uh, it depends on if, are, um, if you're trying to do an alert plugin or a detection plugin, or if you're just trying to write uh, complicated rules. Um, are, I mean, do you know what kind of features you're thinking of? Okay. Oh, okay. For a user of it who has a development background, and what's a good way to get okay. comfortable with it? Sure. Okay. So for for the question is more about how to use it as um, as a user who's also a developer. Uh, so Snort by itself is. I mean, that's the way I usually use it. It's just it's console, but I'm also not. To be honest, I'm not using it as a network administrator would. So my my use case is a little different. Um, I would recommend that what you can do is use something like Barnyard for, for importing rules. And then, um, actually, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the, what a web GUI would be for, uh, look for Unified 2 is one of the outputs. And there are different processors for that. Uh, and, and what I would recommend is find some of the utilities that are out there right now that do similar to what you're talking, what you'd like, and then modify those. But there is good documentation on the Unified 2 file format, and you can tell Snort to spit that out. And then since you do ask as a developer, I would look into how the Unified 2 file format's done and how, you, how to peel out the different pieces. And the good thing about the Unified 2 file uh, format is that it actually spits out a lot more information than you, than you would get through a normal log. You can get access to all sorts of alternate buffers. Uh, it'll actually spit out the, um, the original URL, usually put out the original URL that was uh, the cause of some web traffic, for example, where if you look at just the alert data, it'll tell you the packet that caused the alert, but if it's later in the traffic, all that information will be gone. So it actually has the ability to look, I don't want to say look back in time, it's just it was set back then, right? So yeah, so I, lo I look at Unified 2 and, uh, and parsing that information. Help you? All right. Cool. And then, so that would be on the output side. On the input side, I would definitely look at, um, at pulled pork, which is written by J.J. Cummings. And that, what that does, you, you get a, uh, a license. And really, all it does is just makes it easy for you to grab the snort rules from, uh, from snort.org and then massage it all together, turn rules on or off based upon, your, um, based upon your rule set, whether it be a default rule set or a modified rule set. So it'll actually remember your modifications, which is good because otherwise what happens is we'll modify a rule to either fix false positives or improve detection or whatever else, and you may or may not catch that without, without a nice management tool. All right. Anything else? Ooh, ooh, ooh. What? Hi, uh, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how having an open source security product can make a product more or less secure, you know, by letting people directly look at the code. What a fantastic question. So, <laughs> so okay, so the question was, uh, does having a product be open source make, a, make it more or less secure? The answer is both. Um, on the one hand, you get, um, on the one hand, you get a lot of people looking at the source code and a lot of people can do the reviews and they will find the vulnerabilities and let you know and possibly even provide you a patch and make it better. 
Whereas if it's closed source, they can't see it and the bug can exist for years and years and years and no one will know because that never happens on open source. Like yesterday with, uh, with uh, the get host by adder, which was a bug that was in, in existence for 15 years and just finally came across or released yesterday. Um, honestly, when I, saw the, when I saw the patch, I was like, how did no one ever notice this? But, you know, I didn't do the code review either, so obviously I can't criticize. Uh, and even the OpenSSL bug, you know, earlier last year, uh, same, same thing. Open source, the, the, the code was always there. You know, just nobody ever noticed until finally somebody did. And uh, when I saw that bug, I, I knew immediately somebody right now is, is very, very mad that somebody just, just released information about a vulnerability they've been exploiting for years. Uh, but on the flip side, when it's, when it's closed source, may or may not ever happen, right? It makes it a lot, a lot easier to find that stuff when, um, when you have people able to look at the source. I'll get to your question in a moment. There's actually a great example of where being open source does turn stuff up is, and even slide it in, uh, somebody noticed in a code commit uh, years ago, actually forget the product, I wish I could remember, but somebody noticed in this code, said, looked at the, uh, the login logic, and basically what happened was he looked at the logic and said, you know, if you just send no username, it'll just let you in without a password. I think this is a coding error. It turned out that actually somebody did it on purpose, but, um, but without it being open source, it could have gone undetected for forever. Yes? If, if one starts uh, to uh, develop some snort rules today, would you start with uh, three now or with the uh, other version? All right, so the question is, if you're writing Snort rules today, would you snort, start with Snort 3.0 or the Snort rule language of today? I would definitely use the rule language of today, and the reason is because uh, Snort 3.0 won't be released, like fully released for, um, for at least a year. And also because Snort 3.0 actually allows you to import uh, Snort 2.9 rules and does the conversion for you automatically. Uh, currently, it's actually inside the since it's there now, I imagine it'll stay there. But Snort will actually do it for you automatically, as opposed to having to pre-process it. Um, but the other truth is that if you write Snort rules using the existing rules language, everything you learn from doing it that way will be directly applicable to the new version. It's just that it'll be rearranged differently and hopefully prettier. So um, is Cisco committed to keeping Snort open source? Uh, so, two things about that. First of all, absolutely. Uh, when Sourcefire was acquired by Cisco, before Sourcefire was acquired by Cisco, Marty gave a great presentation to the, uh, to the executive leadership team of Cisco and said, hey, you can't, you can't make this closed source. And he ended up uh, convincing them and they're fully on board, so, so there's that reason. But also, the great thing is that Snort was released under the GPL, and once code is under the GPL, you can't undo that. So. Whether we wanted to make it closed source or not, we can't. And on top of that, we can't. When we add stuff to build upon Snort, we have to be very careful about what we do uh, to make sure that we don't do any violations of the GPL because it's, it's commercial entities tend to not like the GPL. They tend to like the, uh, the BSD license because the GPL is very easy to taint anything that any, comes anywhere near it. So you write a piece of code and it just blindly touches it over here and boom, oh, that's open source as well where uh, BSD license lets you close source stuff that you do modifications. I mean, it's an oversimplification, but we'll go with that. So yes, yeah, so Snort will, will absolutely remain open source, zero chance of, or zero um, intentions of changing that. Yes? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, okay, so the question was, can you open up your code um, and make it open source while maintaining the IP? Uh, absolutely, uh, the GPL protects that uh, for one specifically. Um, you absolutely maintain, maintain uh, your intellectual property rights of that. Once everyone starts uh, contributing to that, eventually the behavior might change or the, it may be different from what you intended it to be. Mm -hmm. So, do, is there any protection against that, or it's totally up to the? 
Uh, so the question is, if people modify it sufficiently from the original, do you still maintain your, your intellectual property rights? So that's a, that's a great question. I'll, I'll preface my answer with I am not a lawyer, <laughs> but I will do my best, which is the code that you write and you put under the GPL, GPL maintain, beca remains yours. Um, so what, you, what you're describing, well, there's two situations, well, two obvious situations, so I'm sure there are more where that would happen. Uh, one is um, in the case of uh, Eric Raymond, where he, what he used as his example for, for that essay, for the Cathedral and the Bazaar, was he, you know, after Linux came out, he's like, wow, that's really fascinating. I'm surprised that works. It's chaos. It shouldn't work at all. Well, he had a need for uh, a POP3 client that did something a little different than what was available at the time. This is all, you know, early 90s problems now, but stay with me. Um, so he found something that did close to what he wanted, right? But it didn't do everything. So he submitted a patch to the original developer and said, hey, you know, I fixed this, I added this feature, gave him the code. And what he found, well, the developer got back to him and says, yeah, I, I really, I haven't done anything on that. I, I don't care about that anymore. So, they, you know, it kind of became a dead project. But, you know, uh, Raymond kept talking to him and he said, hey, I'd like to take it over. And what the original author did was he had found a good successor, a, a competent and enthusiastic successor to his project, which is what is defined as the last task of what you should do for your open source project is when you're done with it, when you decide either it does what you want or you don't have time or you lost, lost interest or whatever, uh, find someone else that can, that can keep going with it. So, so, uh, so, he kept, so he made new developments and he, he kept building on that project, but eventually what happened was he got a submission to that project that totally changed it. I mean, it made it so much better. It made a feature that he didn't even think of at the time. And by doing that, he was able to get rid of a lot of code that he didn't like. It was kind of kludgy. It didn't, it worked, but there was all this extra configuration stuff that happened and everything. And that's when he turned it into, got rid of the old name. It was, it was uh, Fetch Pop, I think, it, you know, or no, it was something Pop, I forget, sorry. Uh, and it became Fetch Mail. Okay, so when that happened, that's, what, a little different, but generally it's like what that's called as a fork, which is something that absolutely happens at open source projects. Depending on your uh, point of view, they're good and they're bad. Uh, so you have, really depends on what the, what the cause is, right? So you have the project that's kind of going in this direction and all of a sudden somebody says, yeah, I don't like that direction, boom, they fork and they go off this way. Uh, either they make it a new project or they just add features or whatever. Uh, when it does that fork, you would maintain all rights to the code that you have in there, but if eventually they replace all that old code, then it would be there, isn't it? Is my guess. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but again, it, it's all protected under the GPL anyway, so regardless of whether this happens or not, it still remains in the open source domain and people are able to grab it and do with it what they want, whether it be to add to it, subtract from it, take it in new directions, stuff like that. Yes. How do you guys go about regression testing? Is it the internal team mostly, community mostly, or a mix? Uh, so how would you do regression testing with an open source project? So one of the great things about open source is that you find that there are people that like doing all sorts of things, okay? As, a, as pretty much a hard and fast rule, developers hate doing documentation. I mean, they just hate it. I'll write code all day. Don't, don't, make, me, don't make me write down a word of, of documentation. Um, and yet, you look at the open source community, you look at Linux, for example, there's great documentation. One of the reasons why is because there's people that actually really enjoy that. So when it comes to regression testing, again, something that I, I do when I have to, but mostly works for me. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not talking about development work for Cisco. I'm not a developer for Cisco. Um, there are two things that could cause that, or multiple ways anyway. So yes. Uh, any good coder will always have some tests that they run to make sure that stuff that used to work still works. But the other thing is, if you have this rapid release cycle, 
there's a little more leeway. I mean, you don't want to, if you put out too many, too many releases that breaks everything, people are going to say, oh, this is terrible and just leave. But if, you know, if occasionally something creeps in, then it's not a big deal because they know it'll be fixed right away. I mean, just because you have a, a normal two week release cycle, if you, you release something and it's broken, wake up the next morning and there's a I don't know, 100 emails in your inbox saying, hey, this is broken, fix it, then, then um, they're, they're tolerated a lot more. And that's actually something that we, we benefit from with our snort rules that we put out through Talos is that we do our best to make sure that we don't have false positives, but because we are responsive and we always fix things right away and stuff, or at least we try to, uh, our customers are a little more tolerant of that sort of thing. Answer your question. <laughs> How do you measure success in an open source project? You sell your company for two point seven billion dollars. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Really, it depends on. Uh, really, it's an individual thing. So. I actually, so in addition to doing some early coding, early contributions to Snort, I also did a lot of other things. Um, you know, I was fresh out of college and had all this extra time and, you know, uh, there's a lot, of different, a lot of different projects that I contributed to, but also I put out some of my own things. One of these things that I did was called Advanced Color Logs. It was actually, honestly, me learning how to code Perl, but it actually had some legs for a while and I'd start getting these patches and uh, feature requests and. Like I said, they, people would actually send me code of, hey, you know, you should add this feature. Here, have code to do it. So if you look through it, it's this hodgepodge of, you know, one person submitted something in this style and somebody submitted in this style, and I was still learning it, so it's all crazy. But I actually consider that kind of, kind of, a, uh, kind of a success story because I wrote that in like 1997 or so. I actually still use it regularly, and when I switched a couple jobs, I, uh, I suddenly realized I'd lost my copy of it. I went, oh no, you know, I wrote this thing 10 years ago, what am I gonna do? You know, there's this internet thing. I actually, so I Googled my own project and I found that at some point actually people, somebody thought it was useful enough, they actually made an RPM module for it and I was able to download my own code. Somebody took the time to make a module for it and, and put it out there and then there were patches that, that actually I was like, wow, awesome. <laughs> so that's my own little personal thing. I mean, obviously it didn't bring me any financial success, but you know, it's, it's cool that somebody was using it. And honestly, bug reports, some people get really upset about bug reports, like, oh, my code, oh, it's terrible, blah, you know, or you're insulting my code. But I personally, I love bug reports because a bug report means somebody's using it. If you put software out there, there's no such thing as software that doesn't have any bugs. If you put something out there and there's no bug reports, that means nobody's using it. So, so there you go. If people use it, and, or even if it just does what you need, then, then I consider it a success. I mean, it depends on, again, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to sell it, obviously you want more people to use it. But as long as it fills a need and does what you need, and maybe somebody else out there also says, hey man, this is pretty cool, you know? Every once in a while I'll do that, I'll find some piece of code. It's like, um, you know, I'm trying to solve something and then I find something that does most of what I need, I'll send them an email. It's like, cool, this thing's awesome. Thanks for putting this out there. So, yes. You mentioned you mentioned Talos a few times in your deck there. What exactly is that? What a fantastic question. <laughs> the Talos is, <laughs> I love seeing you guys get those. Um, oof, actually, I, I should probably uh, put together a good answer for that. Talos is a conglom is a mashing all these different pieces of security that, are, that were spread out throughout, throughout Cisco and are now brought under the same umbrella. Um, it started, it's, being le it's led by Matt Wachinski, who, uh, who ran the VRT in Sourcefire, which was our little ragtag band when I started in the VRT. I was one of six people, and the person who now leads this giant thing inside of Cisco, um, he was one of you know, us six people that wrote rules and did stuff. So, uh, so VRT, the vulnerability research team, expanded a bit. Uh, we had some acquisitions through Clam AV and and other things and just natural growth by getting bigger and doing more stuff. But then Talos now has 
now ha is the umbrella of having vulnerability research, uh, rule development, um, vulnerability finding, uh, outreach, putting out blog posts, fantastic blog posts were put out in the past year, which somebody right there can tell, like, uh, like String of Pearls and the other stuff, and a great blog post about Heartbleed and more stuff. Um, yeah, so all sorts of uh, research stuff is put under there. Uh, it's a great organization, Talos, with a funny S, funny O, I mean. Did I answer your question? Guy right in front of you probably should give, give him a microphone. He'd probably give you a better answer. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Yes. What's that? You write some code and then you uh, make it open source, and then a lot of people immensely contribute to that. And then someday, at some point, someone is interested in getting that, right? And then they pay you a hell of a lot of money. So do those people who have contributed, can, can they come and claim some of that? Oh, OK. So the question, if I understand correctly, is somebody, uh, somebody contributes to an open source project, and we'll just say under the GNU license, I mean, it could be anything. Um, and then the, 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 the project ends up making a lot of money. Like it gets turned into a company and then get sold and everything else. Can people who contribute get money for that? Uh, generally speaking, no. And the reason why is that the open, actually, let me, let me pull back on that a little bit. Uh, there's nothing that says they have to. Um, using Linux as an example, when uh, not VA, actually, was it not VA Linux, when, yeah, when VA Linux, I think, was when public, uh, or no, when Red Hat got public. Sorry, Red Hat, for example, made a lot of money on, on Linux, or makes a lot of money on Linux, which Linux is open source. But what they did, which was a, which was a nice move and, and probably a smart move on their part, is they gave a lot of, um, a lot of stocks to people like Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, and said, hey, you know, we, owe our, we owe, our, owe our success to you. Why don't you uh, get some benefit out of this money that we're getting from our IPO? Uh, but there's nothing that requires that to happen. So if, if you're coming at it from the point of, you know, I have an open source project and there are people that are contributing, do I have to give them money when I make money? There's nothing that says that has to happen. But you can certainly, I'm standing in the wrong place. Uh, oh. Anyway, so yeah, it, would, it brings goodwill to, to do it if you can. I mean, it, it all depends. Uh, but yeah, you don't have to worry about being sued for it. That's, they, gave, you know, they gave up the rights with, uh, with the license that they put out. That's the thought. Actually, on that note, um, I've talked a lot about Snort. Uh, Sourcefire is by no means even close to the only company that uses Snort and makes money off of Snort. Um, you know, we do we do make some money off of uh, licensing, and really, if another company uses it, they sh they're supposed to pay us for a license. Um, but we know that well, I'm not going to name names, but we know several companies that use our technologies, and either they sell other other glue around it to make it, uh, you know, provide the same thing as we do, which is uh, management and scalability and somebody to yell at when things don't go right and everything. But also we have rule sets that, you know, our rule set is also freely available off the internet. We know people that actually don't even give us money that they're supposed to that uses that, those rule sets and makes money reselling it and embedding it into their own products. Um, I don't know, that's what they make lawyers for, I guess. <laughs> But, but that's, a little, that's actually kind of the flip side of it. Right. Anyone else? Cool. Well, then I'm going to give you the piggy. I'll throw this, it's soft. And then, you right? Yeah, there you go. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a great day. <laughs>